In this activity, which is activity four in this section, I'll be using my Digiland Analog Discovery 3 device to do a practical experiment that involves an RC high pass filter. And the nice thing about these filters, as you already know, is that they only have a couple of components. In this case, just because I've got just the two components, I'm not even going to bother with the breadboard. So I'm just going to uh, connect them by twisting the pins together. I'll come back to that in a moment. Since this is the first practical uh, hardware-based experiment that involves my Analog Discovery 3 device. I just wanted to really quickly tell you a couple of things about this particular device so that you know what I'll be working with. Now, having gone through the Analog Discovery 3 presentation, just wanted also to let you know that you don't need to have the same device. You can do the experiments that I'm going to show you with a regular oscilloscope, with any other PC-based oscilloscope, so you can use your desktop or your PC-based oscilloscope if you want. I will be showing you how to use the Spectrum Analyzer in the Analog Discovery 3, which is very handy, but is not necessary for the calculations that I'll be showing you. The oscilloscope part is what I'll be using and I'll be basing my calculations on and my observations. So a nice thing, that I really appreciate about the Analog Discovery 3, as you'll see, is how flexible this device is, and you can do a lot of very interesting experiments with it. So I'm not going to go through the details. Uh, you can see all the technical details about the Analog Discovery 3 on this page here and down here in the features. You see all of what this device is capable to do. So I'm going to leave it up to you if you want to consider purchasing one of these tools. I do find it very useful. So if you are committed to learning electronics, uh, you could consider investing in uh, one of these devices. And there's others, of course, in the market that you can also consider. I'm not advocating that you get this particular one. Okay. Now, uh, having said that, let's go to the Waveforms application, which is the software side of the Analog Discovery 3. And I find that this is really why, what makes the Analog Discovery 3 such a good tool for learning electronics. And this is the workspace. And on the side here, you'll see all the various functionalities that are available through this device. So there is the oscilloscope, the uh, wave generator, arbitrary wave generator, power supplies, a bunch of other things. I'm not going to be using most of them, but in this experiment, I'm going to show you how to use the oscilloscope, the waveform generator, which will be the tool that will supply our sine wave to our RC filter. I'll be using also uh, the spectrum analyzer right here and the network analyzer. Now the network analyzer kind of deceivedly named this tool here I'll be using to uh, give me an experimental measurement of the frequency response of the filter. So it doesn't do network analysis in the sense that it's not going to analyze, say, my local Ethernet or Wi-Fi network. This is specifically for uh, presenting me, in this particular case, the frequency response of this filter. So I'm going to come back to that as well. Now, let's go ahead and set up the experiment. As I mentioned in Activity 4, the topic is an RC high pass filter, and this is what an RC high pass filter looks like. So we'll connect the capacitor to the input sine wave, and then the junction between the capacitor and the resistor is where we will sample the output. This capacitor for this experiment is, let's see, I'm looking at my documents here, is uh, 100 nanofarads, and the resistor is a uh, two kilo ohm resistor. And I actually, did measure the capacitor and the resistor on my oscilloscope just to verify that the values of the actual components are close or very close to the ones that I'll be using later on to do my calculations because I've also got a Python script and they do come very, very close. So the capacitor is 101 nanofarads measured by my oscilloscope and the resistor works out to be 2005 or something like that. So very, very close, well within the tolerances. All right, so I'm going to not worry about the breadboard. So I'm going to put this aside and I'm going to attach the two components together just by twisting the 
pins, I'll do it as tightly as I can. And that will also allow for the measurements to be a little bit cleaner because the measurements would not have to uh, deal with the capacitances between the rows of the breadboard. So that will improve a little bit the quality of my measurements. It's also going to make it easier for the alligator clips and the, the hooks to attach on the pins. All right, so I've got my circuit ready. <laughs> I will connect it in a moment. I also want to talk a little bit about what you see here on the digital device. So obviously the digital device is this, and it's got a bunch of connectors on the side here, the spin connectors, and I have attached the oscilloscope add-on. And the oscilloscope add-on contains the, this side here, which provides two signal generator ports. And on the other side, I've got my oscilloscope ports. So here I've got a BNC connector cable to waveform generator one. You can see W1 right there where I'm pointing. And I'm going to use that to provide the input signal to my circuit, to my filter. The other side, I've got the two oscilloscope probes, which came with the device. And both of them are set to 1x for magnitude, which is good. I've made mistakes like that in the past, which really wasted a lot of my time. And um, I've got the two probes. I plan to use the yellow one to sample the input and then the red one to sample the output. Another thing that I've got here, I can see, yeah, see that this device I'm going to use my tweezers to point this out. There are jumpers here, which are used to set the mode for each of the probes. And I want them to be on DC. Sorry, I want them to be on AC. AC. So therefore, uh, they will reject the DC component. Make sure that those are both on the AC side, like this. All right, now that I've done all that, I'm going to go the, and do the connections. So the yellow jumper wire is the input. So as per the schematic that you see up here, see from the sine wave uh, waveform generator, we go to the capacitor. So yellow is for the capacitor, like this. Make sure that the connection is good. Yep, it's attached. And I'm going to use the yellow probe to sample the input. So I'm just going to use the hook like that. All right. On the other side, I want to sample the output. And as per the schematic, the output is sampled from the junction between the capacitor and the resistor. So let's use the hook here. And. grab the junction like this. Okay, so all that is done. Now I just want to do the grounds. So the I'm going to use just one of the hooks from, from the, the two probes because the probes are grounded together. So I only really need to use one of the ground uh, alligator clips to provide the reference for the ground like that. And of course, I also need to ground the signal generator. It's a little trickier because the alligator clip for the ground here for the signal generator is a little coarse, so it doesn't really grab very well. Maybe I can attach it one alligator clip on the other like this, and that will give me a, a good connection. All right, so that's what it looks like. It's a little messy but I'm pretty sure that it works. We'll know in a moment. Okay, now let's go back to waveforms, the application that I'll be using. I can gonna leave the slide there. And uh, let's begin by bringing up the oscilloscope and the waveform generator. All right, so we know the two components 
the capacitor and the resistor. And when you run the calculations, I'm just going to show you my notes here, which is also containing a worksheet in the end. You'll see it a little later. And after doing the calculations, I worked out that the cutoff frequency is 796 hertz. All right, so that means that if we run some experiments by tweaking the frequency down here, see I've already selected sine wave, that's by default. Let's go for a very small frequency. Uh, should be the other way down here. Let's say 100 hertz. You can select it from the drop down or you can just type it in directly. So you can go at any uh, frequency that you want. And for the amplitude, I'm going to go for the two volts because that's what the problem is directing us to do in this particular instance. So let's go for two volts peak to peak. And I'm going to start it now. So click on run and now the output is coming through. All right, so let's go to the oscilloscope now up, up on the top side. And remember, I can rearrange those windows in any way that I like. I can maximize or I can detach and have those windows arranged in any position that I like. And click on run. All right, and now you can see what is happening on the oscilloscope. Now I can use my mouse and change the time domain division or the voltage. So as I'm placing my mouse over either axis and then use a scroll wheel, I can change. I can also click and then drag and that drags essentially time left or right. It's really nice. That's what I really like about PC oscilloscopes uh, that, that, that do have some user interface elements that really make it easy to interact with whatever you're seeing. Now, on the right side here, you see the parameters. So the offset is zero for both, which is good. Uh, the range is 505 millivolts per division. Just want to make this equal for both so I can compare much better. And now what you see is a difference between the output. So the output is the blue wave and the input is the yellow wave. And you can see how attenuated the output is compared to the input, right? Which is what we expect because this is a high pass filter, low frequencies like the 100 hertz that I'm working on now. I'm actually going to detach this window. So I'm just going to detach it and put it aside. You can see that this is 100 hertz, it's a low frequency, so it gets attenuated quite a bit. And of course, you can make measurements. I'm just going to minimize this to get more of the waveform. And you can see up here, you've got cursors. So you can check to see what the voltage is up there. So it's pretty much 2 volts at the input. And then the peak of the output is at 272 uh, millivolts and just click to fix the cursor and you can see the delta of the output versus the input here minus 1.7263 volts so that is the attenuation uh, another thing that we can do here is to measure the phase just going to show you another aspect of my notes so if you look at this here you can actually download the the notes and a worksheet unless you have purchased the book, in which case you'll find this exact page that I'm showing you in the book. So here is the table for recording your results. I'm looking at what is it now 500, no, sorry, 100 hertz, which is not in this list, but it doesn't matter. The principle is the same. It can record the input amplitude, which should always be two volts in this case. And then the output amplitude, which as I mentioned is 272.8 millivolts in this case, and then work out the input to output ratio or output to input ratio, and then the phase shift. So now I'm going to show you how to figure out what the phase shift is. So what I'm going to do is to measure the time difference or the time delay between the peaks down the bottom here. So to do that, I'm going to increase the time domain division here by placing my mouse on the horizontal axis down the bottom and then using the scroll wheel to just essentially zoom in. All right, that's one thing that I'll do. The other thing that I'll do is to make sure that the offset is about the same. I'm just going to play around just to see 
what it's like. Now notice that the range for channel one is 650 millivolts per division, and the range for the second channel, the output is 100. That's okay. Like normally if I wanted to see what the two waveforms really look like when you compare them, I would make sure that they have the same range. But what I want to do now is to measure the time difference between the peaks. And to do that, I find it that it's easier to come up with a voltage per division of the two waveforms that they put them uh, relatively close together. Because what I can do once I have done that, so you can see pretty much like it is now, I can use this cursor here to point exactly where the peak is for each of the two waveforms and click to lock in the measurement and you can see now that the delta time which is this number right here the delta x because that's x is on the horizontal axis is 2.244 milliseconds right so that is the difference at 100 hertz between the output and the input signals so that the input signal and the output signal have a difference in the time domain of 2.244 milliseconds. So what I'll do, so I'm gonna go here on my table, just gonna put a new row down the bottom because I'm working at 100 hertz and just mark this information. So at 100 hertz, the phase shift in time, so I'm just gonna write this as delta T, is equal to two, Point two four four milliseconds. Now remember that we have a formula that can give us the phase shift in degrees when we know what the delta T is, which is this number right here, times the frequency. The frequency in this case is 100 hertz times 360 degrees. So if I make this calculation, just going to do this off camera. So the answer here for the phase is approximately 80.7 degrees. Okay, so that is again 2.244 milliseconds, which is 2.244 times 10 to the power of minus 3, times the frequency, which is 100 hertz, times 360 degrees, and that gives us 80.70 degrees.